household has uh, eight or nine uh, meters in it. That's we have a separate water meter on the domestic hot water. We have a separate uh, electric meter on the electric dryer. Every Sunday night, my faithful tenant here goes around and reads all the electric meters, and then we have the household caucus. Who ran the electric dryer? With the two more kilowatt hours on the electric dryer than the year, the year before. Well, one of the things I did is put a, a one hour meter on my refrigerator. And it takes about a kilowatt hour a day, electric refrigerator. And I took and put insulation on it. You can see the insulation here, right? Stuck on the outside of the refrigerator. If you look in the background, you can see there's a kitchen counter there and a coffee pot and so on. Well, the insulation, ins the inch of insulation, knocked it down to 0.7 about kilowatt hours a day. As I saved about 0.22 kilowatt hours a day by putting that foam on the top of the refrigerator. Now the insulation in this refrigerator saved 0.22 kilowatt hours a day. Now you take 0.22 and multiply it by 365, the number of days in a year, and there are 10 to the 8 refrigerators in the United States. That is, there are a lot of households in the United States, and a lot of households have two refrigerators in it. So if you multiply by 10 to the 8th, you get 8 times 10 to the 9th kilowatt hours a year, and that's the Seabrook Nuclear Station. So if you put an inch of foam on the outside of your refrigerator, you buy a big nuke. But if you look at it your way, 0.22 kilowatt hours a day, a kilowatt hour costs about uh, 17, 18 cents, and this is a fifth of that. Who's going to bother with this? Nobody's going to bother with putting a foam on the refrigerator because uh, it's awkward and inconvenient and doesn't really make it. But when, when you multiply by 10 to the 8th, oh, you get a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of dollars. And now, this slide was made back in uh, Bill Clinton's day when he made a uh, State of the Union message in which he was going to have a million solar roofs. And I remember this, uh, the State of the Union message. Both Democrats and Republicans applauded. A million solar roofs, how about that? So I went and made some roofs and made some assumptions there. So 10 to the 6, that's a million solar roofs. Now, the efficiency is a little better now, but I assume to be 10%. I assumed that a solar roof would be 10 square meters. I assumed that at every day there would be five hours of uninterrupted clear day sunshine, which is a little optimistic. You know, 365 days in the year. So that gives you two times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours a year. Nowhere near as good as the foam on my refrigerator. Because you can put a million solar roofs up. And you don't get the energy savings you get associated with putting an inch of foam in your, which you're not going to do. This gets back to this business about dilution and so on. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a, uh, a great fan of uh, nuclear power. Uh, back in uh, 1953, there was a full page ad in the science magazine, no, American scientists, that said, they were going to take the submarine technology um, and make a civilian nu nuclear power plant, small one, 70 megawatts. And they needed thermodynamicists, fluid mechanicists, heat transfer people to work on it. So I polished up my resume and sent them a letter and said, I, I want a 10 week summer job. So when I told them what it was, I thought I could do. So they wrote me a letter, come right on down for an interview. So I went down to Bettis Field. And the personnel man opened my folder and he said, oh, he said, Mr. Hill, you shouldn't have asked you to come. The nuclear submarine is in the same building. And for you to work here, we've got to pay by the hour. The FBI to talk to every school teacher you ever had, every landlord you ever had, to make sure you're not a security risk. And for a 10-week summer job, we just can't do that. But it's my fault, not yours. Your letter's clear. You want a 10-week summer job. And I'm sorry, we just can't do it. But he said, you're here, so we'll give you the tour. So I went around and talked to several department heads and had lunch with this, the engineering manager. And I got back to the personnel man's office. And he said, well, this is right in the middle of the McCarthy business. Now, none of you know about what that was, but there was a senator that looked for communists under every. 
He's well, he says, I guess we're going to go through France. And he leaned across his desk, narrowed his eyes, dropped his voice to the whisper of a conspirator and said, you aren't a Unitarian, are you? And I said, no. Well, that's good. He says, we don't get clearance for Unitarians. Now, nobody in the room laughed at right? <laughs> Nobody in the room knows what a Unitarian is. I, I, do you, any of you know what? Do you know what Unitarian is? It's a very liberal Protestant religion, which is about disappearing now. Where they, they, they always said that if, the, if a uh, Unitarian heads toward heaven and a sign says heaven and a sign over here says discussions about heaven, you go this way. <laughs> that uh, they, they were all agnostics and subscribed to all the wrong magazines and so on. Well, actually, they gave me a pretty hard time. On, uh, I was interviewed by the FBI and they were very unhappy with my background. Uh, in 1943, I lived in a boarding house in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and the mail came, well, several of us lived there, the mail was just thrown onto a table. And when we got home from work, each one of us sorted through to pick out our mail. And I subscribed to a left-wing journal called PM. And evidently, the FBI found it. That is, some of the body that they interviewed said, Dick Hill subscribed to PM. And that was enough to send up an alarm that they had to look into me in some detail. And uh, they did. Uh, but I finally passed muster, I guess, and uh, got to be a, uh, got to work on the first civilian uh, a nuclear power plant. Well, I didn't do anything, because uh, you can, don't, they don't take power plant courses, do they? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Well, as you know, a steam power plant has a big problem with moisture as you go down through the steam path. As the steam begins to condense and moisture begins to form. So that in all power plants, you have to have some kind of moisture separation. <clears throat> At the same time, you've got to extract steam for feed water heating. And what I did for the nuclear plant was optimize moisture separation for erosion with feed water heating moisture separation. So it was thermodynamics that goes back to the 1800s. I mean, I, I was doing very classical routine work. And, but when I came back to Maine, I was the nuclear guy. You know, the, as nuclear power began to spread, go talk to Dick Hill because he worked at the nuclear plant. Well, I didn't know him. Uh, but when they started to build Maine Yankee, I got very, I took the students down on tours and some of the, my students worked there. And I was very, very familiar with what, what went on. And I helped Maine Yankee through many of their referendums and their political problems. Well, here's the uh, picture of the uh, high-level nuclear waste in Maine Yankee. And I want to emphasize that that's 125 billion kilowatt hours, or what you see in those cans. Now, if you look up at the top of the cans, you can see tiny little black speck spots. Those cans are still generating a lot of heat from the decay of the nuclear material inside. So they have to be ventilated. Those are, those are concentric cylinders with slots in the bottom and slots in the top. And one of their problems is the uh, birds... Uh, migrating north, fly over this thing, oh, it's nice and warm in here. And so they build their nests in these ventilation slots, so they have a terrible time getting in there to keep scraping out birds' nests from the, from the ventilation. And uh, because I know the people, I don't know them anymore because they're all retired, obviously. But when they first put it up, I had a lot of interest in this. And uh, what I suggested to them was that they uh, take down the fence and put a, a narrow gauge railroad around these cylinders. And uh, on the narrow gauge railroad, they put a flat car. On the flat car, they mount a air operated cannon that fired chalk covered tennis balls. So you could get on this flat car and go around the assembly. And when you see that with those cylinders lined up, you say, kapow! You fire a chalk tennis ball to rabbit ricochet through those cylinders. And then you can get prizes for who got the nearest shot and so on. And then you put picnic tables in amongst all of the all of the cylinders. And then if somebody wants to go in and have a picnic in amongst the cylinders, you give him a counter. So he takes his family in and he takes the counter and has his picnic. And then when he comes out, he gives the counter to the head man. And the you now looks at the counter and gives him a certificate that says you attended the picnic lunch at the main nuclear reactor, main uh, 
high level waste storage, and you receive 0 0.0003 microsieverts during the time. So I said, you get a certificate in Gills and Blue that you can take home and put on the wall to say what your exposure was because you had a picnic in the middle. Much less risk than uh, whitewater rafting uh, would, would be. And, and then you've got some, something to show for the, for the fact that you, you, you did something really risky. You had lunch in amongst all the silver. Well, of course, it, wouldn't, uh, it, it isn't risky at all. The crews are in there all the while uh, looking at the maintenance of them and so on. So I think that uh, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of, uh, of nuclear power, and I think we're making a terrible mistake. By, uh, by, by turning it down. Uh, the main Yankee plan costs something like $300 million to build, and the similar plan now it costs six or seven billion. They just, uh, the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in my opinion, has just gone mad. Uh, one of the nuclear plants, they were spread out, they have cooling towers and so on, and they asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission if they could keep bicycles within the gate of the plant, and uh, so the engineers and whatever could get from one facility to another without having to walk that far. And they said, no, it'd be dangerous. So then they said, well, how about tricycles? And it took them something like six months to decide, yeah, okay, you can have tricycles inside the plant, so you can commute from one part of the plant to the other. The, uh, the, uh, uh, I could entertain you a long time telling you silly stories about regulatory, regula, regulation of nuclear power plants. One of the factors is that, uh, oh, I, I visited the plant. And I was in a little coffee shop where they had a coffee urn, and one of the employees comes in, and he was given a big welcome. Hey, Harry, good to see you. How was the trip? And so on. So I said, Harry, where have you been? I've been off to a conference, he said. I said, what was the conference? And he said, fence. Optics. Fence. Optics. If you're going to put a fence around a nuclear plant, what color do you paint it? Where do you put the, uh, the guard towers? How do you put the floodlights on the fence so that the guard towers can see what's going on? And one of the constraints of the, of the safety of a nuclear power plant, this is long before 9-11, they said that uh, when you plan to counter an attack, you've got to realize that one of the employees of the plant is a, what is the phrase they use? <laughs> well, it, it, a knowledgeable insider. There, that, that's the phrase. That is, the people that are attacking the plant have a knowledgeable insider. Somebody in the plant's going to help them. So when you plan to defend against the attack, You've got a plan to defend against a knowledgeable insider that's going to be there to help the attackers. And they specify what, what weapons the attacker, this is all before 9-11, they uh, specified uh, what the weapons the, the uh, attackers are going to carry and whether they're going to come by land or by boat and so on and so on. Uh, and it's a, just a tremendous amount of money is being spent. Uh, I, I think I'm very trivial uh, concerns about uh, having uh, a terrorist attack a... a a nuclear plant. Um, the uh, oh, one of my oh, I don't, uh, you you ask a 96 year old to come talk to you, all you get is stories, one story after another. I, I convinced that everything is a story. Enthalpy is a story. Entropy is a story. And, and uh, so I, you're just going to uh, have to put up with the, uh, with uh, with with that. Uh, with that uh, background. So let's look at the next slide. Now this one uh, is, is also very recent. Now this to me is a devastating document. Up the side here is megawatts, and it's in thousands. So when you see 10, that's 10 gigawatts. 10,000 megawatts. That's a lot. Now Maine uses steady steady state about one uh, about a thousand about one gigawatt. Because if you look at all the electricity used in Maine, we use about a gigawatt. And here now, down in Texas, they have wind power that at times gets as high as ten thousand megawatts or ten gigawatts. They produce as much energy from wind power, ten times as much energy 
as we use totally in the state of Maine. But now look what happens. You get a day here in March when they get 10,296 megawatts of wind energy. A day later they got nothing. Nothing. Nine miles up from New York City, there are two nuclear plants that supply half the electricity in New York. Two gigawatt nuclear plants. Now you tell me how to take that technology and replace those two nuclear plants in nine miles north of New York City. Somewhere the wind is blowing, isn't it? Maybe in Kansas City the wind is blowing. All right, so we'll put some wind turbines in Kansas City. Maybe the wind is blowing somewhere in Texas, all right? But now we've got to put wires all over the place. So when this one isn't running and that one is running, we still have a 1,000 megawatts to run, the, to run the subways in New York City. It is absurd, just absurd. What act, happens down, if you get down in these valleys, when the wind isn't blowing, you've got to crank up a bunch of 600 megawatt coal burning plants to fill in that valley. Now those coal burning plants have stockholders, they have employees, they have insurance, they pay local taxes, and when the wind blows, they stop. Does that mean the costs are? Can you send the crews home? Well, the crews sit there and play peanut, but when the wind blows, when the wind stops, they crank up the, crank up the, the coal power plant. I just think this emphasis on wind power is absurd. Now it's all right as long as you're in that 10% range, maybe, of uh, the total energy demand. Uh, as one of my friends said who was in the power industry, as long as we don't know they're there, uh, the wind power is fine. Well, when you get stuff like this, I think that what you see in that slide is a disaster. When they go from 10,000 megawatts down to nothing two days later. So you've got to have something ready to go two days later. And whatever you have ready to go is going to, I don't care how cheap this is. I don't care how, you can say the levelized cost for wind power is cheaper than nuclear, on and on and on. But tell me what it costs when the wind stops. And I'll tell you it costs a lot when the wind stops. I don't want to, <clears throat> Oscar Wilde had one of his characters say, I don't think much of his principles, but he's got a delightful set of prejudices. <laughs> Now this is a, a, a picture that came out of uh, the uh, London Economist. And there's uh, Merkel, she's the premier of Germany. And she's trying to fix their energy system. She's not doing very well, according to the cartoon. Everything's broken and she's got an oil can and so on. They've tried to get out of uh, nuclear and tried to get out of coal for, for, current, for global warming reasons. and. Uh, they say deep reform is needed to the huge and inflexible subsidies for renewables, which will cost 24 billion euros this year. Instead, the cabinet is making another reform, tweaking the system in ways that consumers and firms will not notice. In other words, they're going to lie about how much money they're putting into their renewables. They're going to hide it so nobody knows. Because if they knew how much public money they were pouring in to uh, win, the public would be an outrage. But they're going to they're gonna cover it up by ledger demand. <laughs> the, uh, one of the big problems they've got is that uh, the bulk of industry in uh, Germany is down near Munich in the southern part of the state country. All their power is up in the, uh, in the North Sea and the uh, Baltic Sea. And they got a lot of megawatts up there. <clears throat> they try to run electric power lines down, and the public is in outrage. Not in my backyard. You're going to run electric power lines uh, through my backyard to get from the Baltic Sea and the North Sea down to, uh, down to Munich. So they, they, they thought they were going to put in big high voltage DC lines, and they just aren't getting anywhere because of the public opposition. That is, I, I, I think we, the, the world has got to follow the... Uh, the, uh, the, the German experience, because I, a lot of people are using the German experience as the way to go, as they're going to use renewables uh, to replace nuclear and coal, and they're going to run on renewables, and they're going to reduce carbon dioxide and so on. I think it's going to be a tragedy. I think that they, they, uh, it just can't be managed. Uh, 
Now here's a, uh, I didn't get a very good two pictures, but I, I said I did this, this is from my talks to the engineers. The top picture is the uh, hydroelectric plant uh, in Milford. When you cross the bridge to Milford, you see that plant? I think it's a beautiful plant. It's got clear story, arched windows. The one below is the new plant they just built in Stillwater. And I think it's a dump. I don't think they pay any attention to the looks of the plant at all. It's just a box that sits on the dam by the river. Whereas then, a hundred years ago, when they built a hydroelectric plant, they paid attention to it. They wanted a plant to look good. And they got one that looked good. Now they just don't care. And I, I, I somehow feel badly about that. And as, as engineers, I would suggest that you think about how, how it looks when you build something that's going to be out in the public. Okay. Well, I've... Uh, I have said everything I know, and I said three things I didn't know. And so I'll, I'll stop there, and I'll try to uh, answer whatever questions you might have uh, in response to... Uh... Oh, oh, yeah, this just came out today. This, this came in the mail. Uh, the Pocketbook of World Figures. And it, it's done by the London Economist. And when they, I'm so amused at this. When they talk, we talk energy here, as we did, a kilowatts per person, 10 kilowatts per person total energy three kilowatts per person, electricity, and so on. That's, that's American language. In here, they go through every country, and when they talk about the energy, it's kilograms of petroleum equivalent per person. Kilograms of petroleum equivalent. So they don't care whether it's nuclear or hydro or coal. They make believe it's petroleum. And then they put down the equivalent amount of petroleum. In the United States is 7,000 kilograms of petroleum equivalent for each one of us that's in the United States. And I went through the little drill of conversions where I took 2.2 pounds per kilogram, 20,000 BTUs per pound of petroleum, 10,000 hours a year. And we get the same answer we got here. That is the same answer of 10 kilowatts per person. But they do it in terms of, of uh, kilograms. And oh, the thing that is so astounding here, they have for every country, they have the median age, median age of the country. And in Germany, the median age of the country is something like 47 years old. Half of the country is older, half of the country is younger than 47. Run a country that way, you got all the librarians you need, you got all the school teachers you need, you got all the policemen you need. With that kind of a population distribution, you can do anything. These countries in the Middle East that are having so much trouble over here in the news every night, the median age is 15. 15 years. Half of the population is under 15 years old. How can you possibly run a country? How can you have schools and hospitals and police stations in a country where half the population is under 15? I mean, no wonder it's chaos. But anyway, it's a lot of, lot of fun. But I'll stop again. And I'll, yes. Um, so you mentioned how wind and solar might not be yes. as reliable as yes. people think it is. Yes. Uh, but do you think that we'll eventually be able to get completely off petroleum and be 100% reliable oh. and renewable? <laughs> uh, um, I have a facetious answer. In, in this hand, I have a copy of my birth certificate. In this hand, I have a copy of the American Experience Mortality Table. I know what I'm going to do. Any idea what you're going to do? That's a joke. No, no, no. We thought it was very funny. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think, I, I think you, they've got to uh, rely on, on, eventually, on a big bar to run our refrigerators and so on. Uh, that you, you're not going to do it with the renewables. It's just not going to. The, the resource is too stochastic, it has too high a periodicity, and it's too dilute. As when all you can get is four or five watts per square meter, you've got to get an awful lot of square meters out there to make a very small amount of energy, yes. Could you manage the periodicity of wind by like storing energy either with compressed air? Like yeah, it, yeah. Or if, if somebody can find a good way to store energy, that would make a big difference. One thing I've got to, you mentioned it, and I, I thank you for saying it, because that gives me a chance to brag a little bit. Um, you know, a, a college professor.
professors brag about the publish publications they've got. You know, I publish in science and I publish here. Well, I'm published in the Congressional Record. And it worked this way. Back when the Dickey Lincoln School Hydroelectric Project was first touted by Senator Muskie, I did a radio show talking about it. And of course, the public, there, as soon as they heard they were going to make a hydroelectric station out of the Upper St. John, the public went into outrage. All they talked about was deer yards and trout streams and so on. And I got on the radio, I do a radio show every week, and I said, look, this is a, this is a scheme to generate electricity. You ought to look at it that way. Don't think about deer yards and trout streams. And uh, uh, Muskie heard the radio show. He called the station and said he wanted a transcript of it. And they sent him a transcript. And he put the transcript in the congressional record with a little preamble that said, I share Professor Hill's frustration. <laughs> so the, uh, the idea that all the public thinks about it, well, as you can tell, from Maine here, all I, all I care about is the fish getting up the river, which I think is a terrible thing. I think that, that, that it's more of a concession to hydroelectric power would be appropriate than, than, than being so concerned as we seem to be about, about um, fishing in the macro. But yes, if, if uh, I mentioned that, because Dickey Lincoln School would have made an 88,000 acre lake in northern Maine. And that would have been, that would have been a big storage facility. Now you could accept the willy-nilly wind, and you could let the hydro run or not run. Hydro is very good. That is, uh, the, 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 their, their gates like this let the water come out, and there's a wheel that goes around. And the, the uh, beauty of hydro is the efficiency curve is very flat. You can run it full out, make as many kilowatt hours as you need, and the efficiency will be 82%, say. If you go down to half power and quarter power and eighth power, it's still 80% efficient. So that you can, you can follow the load with hydroelectric. And it's, so it's beautiful to say go along with the wind. And that, of course, is what Denmark is doing. They have a, they, there are five high voltage DC lines that go from Denmark up to Norway and Sweden and Finland where they have big hydro stations. So when Denmark has more wind power they can use, it sells the energy upriver. And when they need it, they sell it back. And of course, when it comes back, it's a lot more expensive than it was when it went up. So Dane has the highest electric rates anywhere in the world. They, well, sure, it's all wind power. But in order to buffer the wind power, they have to tie into hydropower in uh, the Scandinavian countries. Because they've got the storage. And without storage, wind is silly. Okay, so running other. Yes. Um, why did uh, Maine Yankee end up closing? Say again. Why did Maine Yankee end up closing? Why did they close it? Yeah, why? Boy, invite me again, Herb. <laughs> no, there were several reasons. Uh, all the while I went down there, from 1968 until it closed in 1996, I knew all the people and I read all the reports and I was very familiar with the whole enterprise. They said, we go up for, um, for uh, license renewal in 2008. We aren't going to do anything that's going to in any way affect that renewal license. That renewal license is sacred to us. Well, they went through three referenda to close the plant. They were constantly harassed by the public and the press. And when, the, and when in 1996 came, the natural gas was cheap. It looked like they're going to be deregulated. Uh, they said we aren't going to go for relicensing. We'll pull the plug. And a lot of it had to do with what I think is nitpicking by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, this is endless nitpicking. For instance, uh, uh, as you can imagine, in a nuclear power plant, they have racks that come out from the wall with uh, wires, racks of wires that, that carry exciting power and all. Uh, uh, everything on these racks. And it seems that the newer power plants have a separate rack for each power source, whether it's exciter power or whatever, they don't put them on the same rack. So that's something new that's happened in power plants since the 1980s. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, we think that's a good idea, so Maine Yankee ought to do it. In other words, rewire the whole plant. 
take all the wires down that you've got in there and separate them all out and put them on different racks. There were endless nitpicking stupidity like that that, uh, that, that forced them in 1996 to say, oh, we don't like the harassment from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and we don't like it from the public. We don't want to fight. They spent $5 million fighting the last referendum. I was chairman of the Citizens Committee, if I don't know if you were around then, but I made endless TV commercials and I talked to every Rotary and Kiwanis club in the state to, to try to keep Maine Yankee open, and we did. We, we, but it cost, that cost $5 million for television time to defeat, the, to defeat that referendum. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's just stupidity and lack of information on the part of the public that, uh, that thinks we're going to do it with pinwheels and estuaries and solar collectors on rooftops and I don't know what all, but it ain't going to work. Periodicity, stochasticity, and dilution. Okay, there anything else that you want to talk about? Okay, well I guess I'll quit then and I thank you for your courtesy. on the back corner when you go out, yeah, unless you're interested. If, you, if you'd like to keep that, uh, I'll let the yeah. Before everyone leaves, uh, another point of this presentation being at this date is uh, Dick Hill's birthday is coming up on the 15th, 15th, right? yeah. Yep, so we're having a little birthday party. You have some cake and cupcakes in the bag, beverages. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Yeah, so we should uh, sing happy birthday.
That's wonderful. Oh, that's boy, that's heavy. Well, thank you very much. Very thoughtful, very engaging. Much okay. So, are we going to get plates back? Oh, there's plates back there, but oh. we'll bring it back. And All right. Why don't you take it back and put it where the plates are? Yeah. 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 Blow it out first. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, too bad. Too bad. <laughs> I'm just going to fire us.